the idea about Easter being Easter eggs and bunny rabbits and chocolate and stuff, right? But the main issue is, as far as uh, followers of the Lord Jesus is concerned, uh, Easter is actually more important than Christmas. Easter is actually more important than Christmas. Without Easter, um, Christmas means nothing. So I think for all of us at the end of the day, it's very important to ask this very question. Uh, Easter actually is a historical incident that happened 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus rose again. The main issue is this, and we should ask ourselves as thinking people, is did Jesus actually rise again? Because if he did, it's no longer about religion. Now, people always think, well, Christianity, then there's Buddhism, there, then there's Islam, and all these different religions. And then if a Christian goes out and says, well, Jesus is the only way, and everybody else is not correct, then people would say, well, this Christian is narrow-minded. Right? And I can see where they're coming from if Christianity is a religion. Right? Then she has a religion, I have a religion, you have a religion, then we all have a religion, and whatever you believe in is okay. Right? But the main thing is, from the Word of God and from a historical point of view, the big question is, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not actually a religion. It's not a philosophy. If you look back in history, there was a man called Jesus, and historians accept that. Right? There was a man called Jesus in history, and this Jesus made claims to be God. So I'm sitting here right now, I'm claiming to you that I am the Prime Minister of China. <laughs> exactly. So you have three choices. Logically, if you use your brains to think about it, you have three choices. I am the Prime Minister of China, right? Or I'm lying, or else I have a mental problem. I'm actually disturbed, and I really believe that I'm the Prime Minister of China. I really have a mental problem. So I actually believe it. So Jesus in history made claims to be God in human form. This is very, very important. Because there's no one, number one in history, that ever made that claim. Going around the city and saying, I am God. So this is important, number one. If Jesus made claims to be God, he is either a liar, or he has a mental problem, or else he is who he is. So nobody in history made this claim. Now, Easter is about the historical, physical resurrection of Jesus. 2,000 years ago, a man, Jesus, died on the cross. This is substantiated by historians. Whether you're a Christian or not, it doesn't matter. History records a man called Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago on the cross. And three days after, he rose again. Now, the question you might come up is, well, how do we know he rose again? We won't get into that right now because time doesn't give us that luxury right now. But here's something for you to think about. If Jesus didn't rise again, today there are no Christians. The first Christians met the risen Lord. They were hidden. They were afraid. The Jews crucified Jesus. All the disciples took off and hid in homes. After that, the next day, three days after, the woman came and said the tomb was empty. There was no body there. The disciples thought, that, well, these ladies have a problem. Well, we know you want to believe he's alive because he, he was a, you know, you, you, you love the Lord Jesus, right? But they went to the tomb and the body was not there. So I want you to think about this as a historical point of view. The, the tomb was empty and you only have three choices concerning the resurrection, Right? The disciples stole away, stole the body. The Romans who guarded the tomb stole the body. Or the Jews who hated Jesus stole the body because the body wasn't there. The New Testament, whether you accept it to be God's word or not, is one issue. The other issue is, if you don't accept it as God's word, it is a historical document. And the passage where we just read right now, the book of Acts, was written by Luke. And you can check this out. Luke is a first-class historian. So even if you are a non-Christian, you have to ask yourself, when Luke wrote this, it is a historical document. As a doctor, he documented what was written, what was said during that time. And so he talks about this man called Paul, which we'll look into later, when he, read, when he mentioned these words. 
right? Paul was a person who hated Christians. And then the big issue right now for today is historians accept Paul as a historical figure, but what changed Paul from being a religious Jew to following the Lord Jesus? If you go back and you get a chance to look at chapter 9, you'll find the Apostle Paul meeting the Lord Jesus. So again, it comes back to the same issue is, did Jesus rise again? Did the disciples, when they met the Lord Jesus three days after, were they hallucinating? Was Paul hallucinating when he said he met the Lord Jesus? So that is a very, very important issue because it deals with us as human beings. If Jesus did not rise again, then basically we're wasting our time talking about this. Easter is a, a farce because Easter goes back to 2000 years ago, 2000 years ago when Jesus rose again and the disciples were not afraid to preach about him. So Easter is a farce, Christians is a farce, this whole Bible actually is a farce because the Old Testament, all 39 books, talk about Messiah dying and rising again, prophesied. And Isaiah wrote about Jesus 700 years at least before Jesus was actually born. Prophesied Messiah would die on the cross when crucifixion was unknown to Jews and that he would rise again. The whole New Testament, every single book talks about the resurrection of Jesus. So we have a problem here is if Jesus did not rise again in history, then this whole thing basically is useless. And you are all thinking people. And we're not talking about religion or we're not talking about something that makes you feel good or doesn't matter what you believe in, you know, as long as it makes you happy. Because if Jesus did not rise again, believing in Jesus is, waste, is actually a waste of time and is really for stupid people. Because you're going around, Christians right now are telling, Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. Well, did he rise again? If he didn't, then we're basically idiots talking about that. But if he did rise again, then Jesus claiming to be God is something very, very serious to think about. Very, very serious. And it's no longer about religion. Again, think about this. Jesus, a man in history, claims to be God. He is or he isn't. There is no, there's no other option. You have to make a choice. If he isn't, then okay, let's just forget about this. Go have some steaks. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you believe in. That's true. The whole philosophy, the whole religion in Vancouver is as long as you believe in it, it's good for you. It may not be good for me. Then that works. But if Jesus rose again, then that philosophy and that religion, it doesn't matter what you believe in, falls flat. Because Jesus claims to be God. He talks about heaven and hell. He talks about if you don't follow him, if you don't believe in him as the eternal God in human form, you are going to hell. It's as simple as that. He said to the religious Jews at that time, devout Jews who worshiped the God of Israel. He said to them who knew the Old Testament, who went to the synagogues, if you do not believe that I am he, they knew that meant God of Israel, I am, you will die in your sins. And they said to Jesus, why are you listening to this guy? He has a problem, even it's recorded. They called Jesus a Samaritan, which is derogatory. They called him also of his name, think he was a crazy man. Why listen to this man, Jesus? He's a nutcase. So Jesus called himself God. So he is or he isn't. And it's very, very, very important to make that understood right now. Think about it. If Jesus is God and he did rise again, believing on Jesus is the most logical and reasonable thing to do. Because when you die, there is going to be heaven and hell. But if Jesus did not rise again, well, heaven and hell could be debatable. It doesn't matter what you believe in, right? You could believe in something. You could make your own religion up. If I give you a sheet right now, everybody has a piece of paper. I give you a pencil and pen and I ask you five questions. Who do you think God is? You better write something down. Where do you think we will go when we die? Who do you think we are? Are we good people or are we bad people? Or are we sinners? You start writing your own thoughts down and every one of us is going to have a different answer. Ask your friends that. Right? And if you give it to your friends, they say, well, I really believe all these things. I believe this about God. God doesn't exist. Maybe she says that. Maybe you say God exists. And people are actually naturally good. She goes, no, people are actually naturally bad. Right? Then you follow that kind of uh, philosophy of what you believe in. That's your religion. Right? So, the big question is this, though. What makes you, let's just use you, AJ, for example. This is just different from your girlfriends. Completely opposite. You say people are bad, Jesus. No, people are actually good. 
You say, well, God exists. And then she goes, no, God doesn't exist. God's in your imagination. Right. And then she could say, well, there are many gods. It doesn't matter what you believe in, right? Every culture has a God, different names. All three of you contradict each other. Wait a minute. You say there is no God. She said there is a God. She says, no, there's many gods. There's a big problem here, right? But the big questions you have to ask yourself is, what makes you so sure what you believe in is right? Right? Let's say, AJ, you say, I don't believe in God. And I say, well, I believe there are many gods. Well, we have a problem with Clara. Yeah. There's a big problem mm -hmm. here. So we actually both have problems, right? We're actually both wrong or else one of us is right. Right? That's the logic. So Jesus, again, going back to history, he either rose again or he did not. If he did not rise again, burn this book. I'll tell you that right now. I don't have time for religion. If you want to believe in that, you want to, you know what you want, this is what I was before I became a Christian. 27 years ago, I wanted to become a gang member. And for me, power and money was the main thing. And if people didn't respect me, just punched them up. That's all it is. Right? As far as I'm concerned, because there's no God, it doesn't really matter. So if you talk to me then of being a Christian or whatever you want to believe in, I think you're in that case. Don't waste my time. Because as far as I'm concerned, you want to live a good life? You want to go to church, pretend there's a God, and live a good life, go for it. For me, I'm going to just enjoy my life and do what I want to do. Because at the end of the day, you will die. You'll be six feet under. I will die. I'll be six feet under. There is no difference because there is no God. Right? So you want to pretend to be good and go to church and don't swear and don't do bad things, go for it. But you're not. You're an idiot. You're wasting your time. I'm going to go there and do what I can to live it up. Because we're both going to die, and then that's it. If there is no God. But if there is a God, then there is consequences. So the big issue is, did Jesus rise again? Here's, very, here's a very simple logic. If Jesus rose again, he claimed to be God, that answers the question of God exists. Because Jesus claimed to be God. I am God, Jesus says in the book of John. But if God doesn't exist, then Jesus has a problem, right? Because he's claiming to be something that doesn't exist. So Jesus made claims to be God, that means God exists. If Jesus claimed to be God and he rose again, that proves he is God. It's natural reasoning, it's logic. You see the importance of resurrection? So the resurrection proves Jesus is God. Therefore, atheism or agnostics, not sure there's a God, does not exist, it cannot exist. So that's why the key issue is, who is Jesus Christ in history? Is he Lord, or is he lunatic, or is he a liar? Right, and did he rise again? If he rises again, he answers every question in life. There is a heaven and hell. There is a God. Their atheism does not exist because Jesus rose again. So that's why this issue about Jesus rising again is very, very important. Easter is not just for Christians. If you think about it in your own time and in your own private room, right? Easter is very, very important for the whole world. According to this verse here, the Apostle Paul says this concerning the Lord Jesus in Acts 17, 31. Because he has fixed the day, he is God, on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now the context of these verses, these are the last words before Paul was thrown out from this group. Here is the context of this verse. If we go back to the beginning of chapter 17, Paul is talking in the synagogue. He's witnessing to the Jews, telling he, because Paul is Jewish. He's showing from the word of God, the Old Testament, that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. He fulfilled all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, and he proved to them that Jesus was the Messiah. And then these Greek uh, philosophers came by, called the Epicureans and Stoics. Now during that time, these were the Athenians, they were the brains. The Athenians were the brains of Greece, and the Spartans, as you watch movies, the Spartans were the muscles of Greece. The Athenians that Paul is going to address right now are the brains. Science, culture, philosophy is the main order of the day. The Epicureans, this is what they believe in. It doesn't matter what you feel, it doesn't matter what you believe in, as long as it feels good, 
then that's, that's correct. Truth is not important. Feelings is everything, right? Well, if you love something, if it feels good, then do it. it there is no right and wrong. As long as you're happy, as long as you feel good, that sounds like Vancouver, isn't it? <laughs> as long as you feel good, then it's right. It doesn't matter what you believe in. You feel good about it, go for it. More power to you. That's Epicureans. The Stoics, you know, English what we call Stoic, being cold, right? They say, no, that's not important. Truth is more important. We gotta use our brains. We gotta use logic, right? So what happens is if something bad happens to you in life, just go with the flow. You can't change fate. So fate is the main thing for them. There is um, no God. There is actually fate, whatever that is, and he controls the whole thing. So whatever happens to you is gonna to happen to you. So roll with it, right? Don't freak out. If it happens, it happens. Just go with it and go with nature, right? It's almost like a man and a woman. Epicureans, more like a woman, right? Oh, I don't feel it's right. Oh, I don't feel it's good, right? But I feel I love him, so I think it's okay. Even though he's married, but I should, I should have a relationship with him because I feel I love him. His girlfriend goes, yeah, do you love him? That's the main thing. Girls think that way, right? Guys are like the Stoics, right? No, no, no. You can't go by emotions. You got to go by logic. You got to think it out. You got to think it out, right? Now, if I get hurt, yeah, I know. That's the way it is, man. You got to go with it, buddy. Be a man. Man up, right? That's what it is. So Epicureans and Stoics are like that, like a man and a woman. So they came to Paul, and Paul was talking to them about Jesus and the resurrection. <coughs> and these, these philosophers are very smart. They go, wait a minute, what are you, what are you, guys, what are you talking about, this Jesus and the resurrection? Come over here, talk, talk to us about him. So these guys, all they do is all they sit there and talk about philosophy. What do you believe in? Oh, that's interesting. What do you think life is about? They spent all day talking about that in Greece, in Athens. They were the brains. So they heard Paul preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. They go, who is this? Come here, talk to us, share us this new God of yours. So Paul goes to this big group and they're all saying, there. tell us about this Jesus you keep talking about in your resurrection you were talking about earlier. What is this? So Paul went there and in the book of cha in chapter 17, he saw this idol there. It's in Greece, even today you can find it. It says, to the unknown God. Right? In Greece, in Greek it says, to the unknown God. Basically, the Athenians had a thousand gods. There's lots of gods all over. They made the statue to the unknown God just in case there's a God they missed. So they didn't want to offend him. So they put it as the unknown God. So in case there is this God we missed out, sorry, this is for you. So they worship this unknown God just in case we didn't want to offend this other God. Right? So Paul sees this and he goes to the unknown God. Actually, this is interesting. The Greek word for the word unknown, they're agnostic. The English word agnostic means I'm not sure if there's a God. So you can sit here today and you can think, well, I don't believe there's a God, that's atheist. If you sit here and say, well, I'm not sure if there's a God, I'm, maybe there is, maybe I'm not, I'm not sure, it's called agnostic. And the Greek word for that, to the unknown God, the unknown means agnostic, to the not sure God. And so Paul is saying, this is an unknown God I'm going to talk to you about right now, right? This Jesus and the resurrection. And so he goes on telling these people about God making the world. Now, the Epicureans, these guys who act like the women, right? They think gods exist, but they are so way up there, they have no clue, nor do they care about what humans do. They are just way too far apart, right? So they know that there are many gods, but gods don't really care about us. And the Stoics, well, they say there is no God. There's only fate, whatever that is, and he controls everything. So if it happens, it happens, you can't control it, right? So Paul is actually addressing that and say, wait a minute, there is a God, this unknown God I'm gonna to talk to you about, he made the world. There is a God who does care. He made the world and he does care about people. It's not by fate. And then he goes on saying, this same God has fixed the day. And our verse right there in verse 31. This same God has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And when he mentioned this, that God made the world and he's fixed the day and the resurrection, the next verse says, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Okay, this guy's problems. But others said, well, we will hear you again. We'll listen to you guys next time. 
So then he dismissed him. So Paul didn't even got a chance to finish his message. He talked about God making the world and he has fixed the day and he will judge the world. And then they just basically some laugh at him. He said, okay, that's, that's enough. That's, thank you. Come back next time. So he didn't finish the message. So the next verse, the verse after he goes, but there are some who did hear in verse 34. But some men joined and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So by the grace of God, in verse 34, some actually believed Paul's message. You will notice in this uh, passage here, Paul did not actually go right into talking about Jesus right away. Because these guys basically laughed him. They thought, well, this is a blood case, right? And they laughed at him when he talked about the resurrection. So right now, in a short time I have, I want to quickly touch on the message Paul would be talking to these other people who actually said, Paul, we, we, we know about this resurrection you're talking about. Tell us more. So some people here laughed at Paul. These people said, Paul, we believe about this resurrection. That sounds very logical. Tell us more. So I'm going to touch on that right now. So when he took Paul aside, this is what he would have said to them based on the writings of the whole New Testament and also the rest of the book of Acts. Paul would have said this to them without, without, without doubt. Number one, going back to verse 31. The resurrection concerning Easter today proves, number one, that there is a God. In verse 31, he has fixed the day. He will judge the world. He has appointed and he has given assurance. All four times in that one verse talks about personal pronoun, about God fixing a day, judging the world. There is a God. So the resurrection, if you're here this, right now, think about this Easter day. The resurrection is evidence that there is a God in this world. There's a creator. Again, if there's no resurrection, then you can argue for that. There is no God. Maybe there, is, maybe there isn't. But the resurrection proves without a doubt there is a God in this world. Number two, in verse 31, he has fixed the day. The resurrection tells us that God is sovereign. That means he controls all things and he fixes all things. He has fixed a day. Earlier in that same book here, if you look at verse 26, Paul addressing these people, these Athenians, he said, and he made from one man, meaning Adam, every nation of mankind, Chinese, Japanese, Afghanistans, <laughs> East Indians, and even Americans, <laughs> to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. This is very important. So that means whenever Alexander the Great conquered certain places, it was because God gave him that power to do so. And God took it away, and the, Roman, Roman, uh, the, Roman, uh, the Romans came and took over Alexander the Great. The Romans fell, and then God gave them to somebody else. So whatever we have right now in our world, in our allotted spaces, whether countries or places, God has set that in his own time. So God controls everything. And all through all history and even where we live today, God controls everything. So right now, if you are here today, you are not here by chance. Even in your own personal life, whatever you do every day, you meeting the Jamesons is not by chance. If God exists and the resurrection shows that he does, the resurrection shows us as well that he controls and fixes all days and everything in our life. He controls all things. We know that because when Jesus died and rose again, that was not by chance. That was also fixed by God. The Bible tells us somewhere before the world, before the world was even made, Jesus was, plan was planned to come into this world, to be born of a virgin, to go to the cross, to die. It was not by accident. And he was raised again the third day, not by accident. So God fixes everything. But God is not like fate. Fate is cold and not proven. God is evident by the creation of the world, and most important, the resurrection of Jesus. We know, and also God cares about people. 
Fate is cold, but God cares. He has fixed a day. Number two, the resurrection proves that God is righteous. Back to verse 31. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will judge the world. We cannot escape that. God is a righteous God. And righteousness and holiness in the New Testament, in the Bible, are always seen together as one. If we say God is righteous, He is also holy. It's like two sides of the same coin. So God is righteous. That means whatever sins we've committed since we were born, we will be judged one day. Nobody escapes judgment. Nobody escapes judgment. Every single one of us born into this world will face the judgment of God one day, either in this life or in the next. And we'll get back to that after. Number three, the resurrection not only tells us that God is sovereign, he's fixed the day, and he will judge the world in righteousness, that he's a holy and a righteous God, but he also has appointed a judge. Look at that verse there. In righteousness, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. So God has already appointed a man. This is very important here. Now, if you read through the whole New Testament, going back to what we said earlier, Luke is the writer of this book, Acts. As a historian, he records what was written, what was said during that time. Luke always focuses on God becoming a human being. If you read the Gospel of Luke, who also, he wrote the same one, as a doctor, he focuses on God becoming a human. So everything in the Gospel of Luke has to do with the hands of Jesus. Everything is very detailed in the Gospel of Luke, as well as in the book of Acts. As a doctor, he is very accurate in pinpointing all these details. And so here, God says he has chosen a man in which he will judge this world. He will judge the world in righteousness by a man, right? But this man in the book of Acts and throughout the whole New Testament is actually God himself in human form. So here's something you think about when you leave. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. He was equal with God the Father. The Bible teaches that God is a triune God. There is Father, Son, and Spirit. It's not three gods, it's one God. It's just hard for us to understand as humans, but in actuality, that's evidence of who God is because he is incomprehensible. And Jesus claimed to be God, and he proved it through his resurrection. And so this same Jesus is the judge whom God the Father has chosen to judge the world. So Jesus is that man that God has chosen to judge this world one day. So that means it's not just Christians, but the whole world will be judged by Jesus. So the main issue is still asking yourselves is who is Jesus Christ, right? It's going to sound narrow-minded for Christians to say that, but as a Christian, we don't go by what we think or what we feel, but we go by what God's Word says and what history says. And history, again, shows that Jesus claimed to be God and Jesus said this when he, was alive, when he was on this earth. He said, He and the Father are one. That all judgment has been committed to me. Right? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said these words, I am the good shepherd. As a Jewish context, this is very important. For Jesus as a Jew to say that in a Jewish context is actually blasphemy. And the Jews knew that. You being a Jew, call yourself the good shepherd. The good shepherd is only one, the God of Israel. But you're just a man. And you call yourself the resurrection and the life. That title belongs to God only. So for Jesus as a Jew to claim that, to be claim, claiming to be God, is actually blasphemy. So this is important. Again, it goes back to is who is Jesus Christ. Right? He has to be God or claiming to be God, he has a problem. He should be stoned to death. His death on the cross by the Jews and the Romans, he deserved it because he has a problem, right? So if Jesus is not God, then we have a problem. So Jesus is going to be that man who will judge this world and we will all stand before him. Look at it one more, one more thing. He has given assurance, same verse, verse 31. He has appointed a man, and this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
So he has given assurance, he has given evidence. Now the word there, assurance in Greek, means evidence. It was like a piece of paper during that time. If I sell you a car, or a chariot during those days, mm -hmm. I sign this deed and I give it to you. This is evidence. It belongs to you. I sold it. So the word here is from that Greek word. It means evidence or proof. So he has given evidence to all people in the whole world, right? That he will judge this world by that Jesus, by giving evidence to the whole world that I am God and I will judge this world through Jesus. And I will show you this to you by raising him from the dead. Again, it goes back to the same thing is, did Jesus rise again? If Jesus rose again, then what Paul is saying is true. And what Paul is saying is true, we we'll all stand before Jesus one day and we will be judged for our sins. But that's not all. And I will close by saying this. These are the ones, those who heard Jesus and his resurrection, they laughed at him. These guys, they wanted to know more about him. Paul would have told them, this same Jesus, who is a judge, is also a savior. And this is what Paul constantly preached, right? The one who became a man went to the cross to die on the cross for sinners. And it is on his death on the cross at Calvary, on the cross, that put away sin. If you would put your faith in the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord who died on the cross for your sins, then you will be saved from the judgment of God. Because it says here, God has set a day and he will judge the world. The same judge is the same judge who died on the cross. So if you reject Jesus now, you will end up in hell. And when you stand before him to be judged for your sins, you really have nothing to say. Because Jesus, the judge, has said, well, I died on the cross for sinners. But you rejected this salvation, what more can you say? Right? So the difference between me and another person is that I'm no better than another person. But I am better off. If you know Jesus, it doesn't make you a better person. But it does make you better off. When the Titanic sunk back in 1912, the ship went down. And whether you're rich or poor, you drowned. There was death, doesn't matter. When you drown, you drown. Those who went to the rowboat were saved, whether you're rich or poor. It had nothing to do with it. So when you were in a rowboat during that time, you were saved. You can look across there, you can see people drowning. You're, no better, you're not a better person than that person, but you're certainly better off because you're in a rowboat. And that person is going down, right? Those who know the Lord Jesus Christ are not, I'm not, I don't claim to be a better person than you, but I am better off because I have forgiveness of sins and I know if I die today, I'll be in heaven because Jesus died for me. And this is what Paul would be telling these people. If you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and trust what he did in the cross to put away your sins, then you will be saved. He is a risen Savior. He rose again to save sinners. And if you put your faith in him, you will be saved. Salvation is, put, is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus, death in the cross, and trusting him, the risen Lord, to be your Lord and Savior. And when you do that, the Bible says you are saved. The reason why people, why Christians, or those who believe in the Lord Jesus won't go to hell, is because Jesus already paid that on the cross. That sin has been dealt with on the cross. So I put my faith in that work. Therefore, the judgment of God cannot fall on me. The judgment of God fell on Christ already. But if you die without the forgiveness of your sins, then you will end up in hell and you'll be judged for your sins. And I would say, in the closing, say this. Last uh, couple, um, last couple of weeks ago, I had four days on set, working in a movie set four days there and God gave me an opportunity in those four days to talk to four different people. One person said, well, there is no judgment. Uh, he actually, he said he died and he went through beautiful lights and feelings and stuff. And he said, there is no judgment, there is no devil, there is no hell, right? He said he went through a car accident and several actually exper uh, experiences where he said he actually came back to life. And he's a pretty stable guy that he just went by his experience. And he said, there is no hell, there is no judgment. And so I talked to him, and I talked to another person who said, well, it doesn't matter what you believe in as long as you're, you're a good person. And then another person said, there is no, people are basically good, and there is no bad people, there is no sin. 
And then another person said, um, he's searching right now about the different religions to see what is true, what is wrong. But at the end of the day, I told them, I said, did Jesus rise again? Right, that's the main issue. Because if Jesus rose again, then he's the only way. If Jesus did not rise again, then we're wasting our time talking about this. They believe whatever you want to believe. So, that's it. Just thanks for the time um, to give up to you, to share with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I hope that you will seriously consider that about the resurrection. It does affect everybody. In our book, it says uh, uh, Jesus never died. That's a good, that's, I'm, yeah, I'm, so yeah. we say he went back to sky mm -hmm. and he will come at the day of judgment. He didn't die? To judge people. So when did he went to heaven if he didn't die? He never went to heaven. He went to sky. He went to the sky? Yeah. So he just walked in one day and... So when they put uh, him in the cross, then after that, uh, they're trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. And they put fire like around him. And the fire was really strong. And the smoke, and at the end, they saw there was nothing. Okay, that's, that's, it's a, uh, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, it's very interesting. Um, I, I use this term Christian faith, right, just to, to in order to separate our because different beliefs. In our religion, we believe, uh, we really love and respect Jesus, like really to the max level. So we believe that he was not a thing to get hurt or to like get killed. He was like, a, like a really loved of God, mm -hmm. like somebody that when Lord love you, so nothing can happen. To yeah. You. So we believe he was one of those people that you can nothing can happen to you. So he will come back at the day of judgment, and they will judge. Interesting. That day. Now um, I hear what you're saying, AJ. Um, this is interesting because in the new in the Bible when Paul. Paul actually hated Jesus, the one who, who preached this in Athens. He hated Jesus. When he actually spoke to these Athenians, that was approximately 18 years already. He knew the Lord 18 years ago before he actually preached to these guys. So according to his own word documented, after he met the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord, right? He spent, he took off for three years and didn't see anybody. So he was clearly thinking it through. Okay, and then after three years, he went to see Peter, those guys. Okay, to find out more about Jesus. Now, uh, the Bible says that um, now Jesus, uh, Paul is a Jew, and remember this: the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, the thirty-nine books in the Old Testament, all prophesied of Messiah dying. So clearly, we have contradictory, right? The Old Testament cl uh, clarify uh, says Messiah would die. Psalm twenty-two, right? And Isaiah 53 are just examples. That the Messiah would actually die and he would come back. And he had to die because of sin, the sins of Israel and the sins of non-Jews. So it's clearly um, mentioned in the Old Testament that the Messiah would die. And Jesus, written again written by Luke, when Jesus came back to life, he said to those who were following, who were walking with him, they were actually kind of blind. They didn't know what was going on, right? They still was in shock. They didn't know it was Jesus who was talking to them. Jesus was saying to them, he opened up their eyes and said, I showed them the scriptures, the Torah, the whole Old Testament, Messiah, how he would die and how he would rise again. And he would bring uh, grace and salvation to Jew uh, Israel and towards the world. So if Jesus did not die, then we have all the Old Testament prophecies should be thrown out. Secondly, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. In order for the resurrection to happen, somebody has to die, right? So if Jesus did not die on the cross, he just went back to heaven, then the whole New Testament should be thrown out, right? And all the historians, uh, Roman historians, uh, they talk about this man, Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the first century there, the Christians were growing so fast, the Romans had a problem controlling them. This is what they wrote yeah. in history. They said, uh, these Christians are believing in this superstition called this man called Christ, Christus, which is Jesus, yes. right?
who claimed, these Christians claimed that he died and came back to life. So this is his history, right? So they know that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Pilate, again, he was the governor at that time who was in control of Judea, and he is a historical figure. He also had a problem with Jesus' disciples and these Jews. Jesus' disciples are talking, following Jesus, and Jesus claims to be God. These Jews are saying, this guy's committing blasphemy. We should have him killed. Pilate was saying, uh, I'm, what's this God do with me? That's your problem. He goes, no, but by our law, we have to die. Well, this is not Roman law. Right? He said, yeah, but he claimed he's, big, he's a bigger king than Caesar. Okay, now he has a problem. Mm -hmm. Now it's politics, right? Mm -hmm. So now he steps in and says, okay, so brings Jesus in. Who are you anyways? Right? Tell me who you are. Right? Jesus said, well, I am, I am, I am God. He said, he's okay, I, 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 I don't know what to do. So he goes up to these Jews and he goes, well, this guy has nothing, nothing. He didn't break any Roman law. So I'm just going to beat him up and let him go. <laughs> right? And that's what he ripped them, right? I'm just going to be Makai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's, he's nothing, there's nothing wrong, right? Okay, he claims to be God. That's your problem, not mine. I'm a Roman governor. It's nothing to do with my religion. So the Jew goes, well, he ought to die because he made himself son of God. Well, that's not my problem. So Pilate said this. He goes, I'll tell you what. Just get away with this whole problem. He said, every Passover, I release somebody out of my goodwill, a prisoner, right? Why didn't call Barabbas who killed people, who was a murderer, or I can let him go, or I can let Jesus go. Make, make a choice. What are they going to say? Hopefully, let Jesus live and let this guy, bad guy, go to jail, right? That was his plan, to get away from this issue. But the Jews go, no, we don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. He goes, what? He goes, are you kidding? He said, no, we want Jesus to be crucified. So they crucified him. This is, again, recorded history, right? So he's, so he's dead on the cross, and again, after that, he came back to life the third day. Now, get this, this is very important. When Jesus was on the cross, it took him down six hours on the cross, at minimum six hours, and then he died, probably more, another two hours before they took him down. But for six hours, he was on that cross, and then he finally died after six hours. They took him down, and they buried him in a grave. Now, this is important because the Bible, as far as Christians are concerned, we argue for um, historical uh, uh, facts, and our faith is not blind, right? I'm not saying that, well, you can believe in Jesus, and that's all that matters. Don't see anything. You know, basically be stupid, right? The Christian faith is based on evidence, just like a court case. So the New Testament is, um, is a historical document that records um, Jesus' body came down, and he was put into a tomb of a rich man. So, number one, they knew where the tomb was. Joseph of Arimathea was the guy recorded as the rich man, a historical figure. He was a rich man, and they buried him in that tomb. So they knew where his tomb was. Now, they took him in there, and then Jesus' disciples were cowards. They hid. They were hiding. Okay? The Jews came to the Romans, right? And he said, look, when Jesus was alive, this guy claimed to be God. And for some reason, after three days, he's going to come back to life. So just to be sure his disciples don't come and steal his body and say he's alive, can you put a Roman guard there? And he goes, okay, go ahead. We'll put a guard there. Okay, now a Roman guard in the, in the first century is not just one guy. Okay, there's a minimum of at least nine guys, right? And they take turn, three guys on duty, and the other rest eat and sleep. You can't fall asleep. If you fall asleep as a Roman guard, they will burn you alive in your own uniform. They were like strict soldiers. So they stood there on guard, just in case the disciples come. So they play your games, eat your food, your turn. So I go down to sleep, and then you stand guard for three days, in case the disciples came. Right? The Bible records an angel came, and these guards were so afraid, they fainted. They had a heart attack. The, the woman came, they went there, the body was not there. The woman went back to tell the disciples, the disciples at first thought they were seeing things. Here's the issue here. In a court case, this is called uh, evidence by embarrassment. If that was made up by men during the first century, they would not use women to be there to testify that Jesus rose again. Women and shepherds were not good witnesses and not good for court. They were looked down upon. 
If men made that story up, they would not have the woman there come back and tell the disciples that Jesus rose again. Bad witnesses. If men wrote it, they would have said, you know what? We follow Jesus. We love him. We went there uh, because we're such good disciples, right? We went there to worship him, but he wasn't there. They would have said that, but it didn't. The, 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 the New Testament records these disciples as lame and stupid and slow. Even Jesus <laughs> calls them that. The woman came back and said, his, his body's not there. They go, well, we know you want to believe that. Even Thomas said that. We know you feel like it. But no, it's impossible. Until yeah, Jesus came. And then they, he said, touch me. It's not a, I'm not a ghost. So it was actually a physical body. right? And even Thomas, seven days a week after it happened, these disciples came. Thomas, where were you, man? Jesus is alive. He goes, well, you guys, uh, I know you want to feel he's alive. I know it feels good to be alive. I don't think so. Until I touch him, I'm not going to believe. So Jesus comes and he goes, Thomas, I'm here. Right? And Thomas, he says, come. Didn't you say you want to put your hand in a hole? Touch me. I'm real. And when, in John, Thomas went to Jesus and held him. And this is what John said. Luke said, uh, Thomas said, he calls him my Lord and my God. Remember, this is very important in a Jewish context. Jesus is standing there, and Thomas is a Jew, calling Jesus my Lord and my God. This is blasphemy. Jesus has to be God, or else he is committing a sin. There's only one God, the God of Israel. So for G Thomas to call Jesus my Lord and my God is blasphemy, if Jesus isn't God. So throughout the whole New Testament, when Jesus was on this earth forgiving sins, these religious people always got mad at Jesus because Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And they were reading, reasoning in their hearts, how can you forgive sins? You're just a man. You're a sinner. Only God can forgive sins. So Jesus constantly made claims to be God, proved it by his resurrection, and that's the issue. So we have, contra it's a contradictory in there, contradictory, right? Again, Christians do not exist today if Jesus did not rise again because the first Christians touched the risen Lord. It is impossible for anybody to be a believer in the Lord Jesus because the first Christians touched him. After they met the Lord Jesus, they touched him, then Peter went on to preach the first gospel, right? And he was not afraid. But before that, he was a coward. If you're going through the four gospels, in the gospels there, Peter said to Jesus before he died, he said, you know what? Even if all these guys here deny you, he said, I will not, I love you. I will love you too. I will die for you. And Jesus said, will you really die for me? He said, yes, I would. I love you more than any of these guys. I love you. I'll die for you. He said, before, before, uh, before the morning comes, before the cock, before the cock uh, crows three times, you know, early in the morning, you will deny me three times. And he did. Right? But what made Peter, the first preacher of the gospel, so bold, who was not afraid? If Jesus did not rise again, then the body is still in the tomb. If Jesus... Wow was actually rose again, then if Jesus stayed in the tomb and he's still dead, then the disciples are liars because they're preaching about Jesus rising again, right? So Jesus, uh, Peter preached about Jesus rising again, 15 minutes from Jerusalem, when he preached in Acts 2, these priests, all these Jewish people, could easily go back and go back to the tomb. They know where that tomb was, the rich man's tomb, right? They couldn't make a mistake and say, here's the body, what are you talking about? He's, not, he's, he's still dead. Right? So the question is, there's an empty tomb. Where is the body? Right? If the disciples took it, then these disciples are idiots because they stole a body and then went out to preach. Jesus is alive, knowing full well he's actually in your garage, thinking of the garage right now. He's still dead. <laughs> right? But Jesus is alive. These guys paid with their lives. These are the, we're not talking about it later on. We're talking about these first disciples who met the Lord. Right? He is alive. They were not afraid. The Jews knew that his body wasn't there. So what happened was when they preached, they beat him up. You no longer preach in Jesus' name, so they beat him up. Why? Because there's no body. If they, if they wanted to, they just take the body out and just say, well, you guys are lying. Jesus, is, he's dead. You see where we're coming from? Here's another one. Two important ones, Peter and James, uh, Paul and James. Paul was what we read about earlier. He was preaching to the Athenians. He was a Christian hater. He hated Jesus. And historically, to this day, non-Christian historians know that Paul and James, Jesus' half-brothers, 
right? What changed them from becoming believers in Jesus? James thought his brother was a nutcase, wouldn't you? If your brother said, you're, your brother, hey man, AJ, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, really, I am. Yeah, sure, sure. No, I'm God. If you believe, if you don't believe me, you're gonna go to hell. You won't. Fit. Yeah. When you go see mom, right? Tell her that. James recorded constantly in his Bible, in the Bible, his family laughed him and thought he has a problem. Except his mother. His mother knew. So they were his half brothers and sisters because Jesus was born of a virgin, and then after that, Joseph and Mary married. They had kids. They had children. Mm -hmm. And these brothers and sisters, they thought his brother was so cuckoo. We can oh yeah, no problem. You see him coming from? So James in history later on became a leader of the Christian church. Right? What made him change the historians are baffled today? What made this half-brother, James the Less, became a leader in the Jewish church in the early centuries? Except for the resurrection. And Paul is the same thing. Paul was a smart man, he knew his Greek, he was a Roman he was a Roman citizen, so he knew Latin, he knew Greek, Latin, he knew Hebrew, he knew the Old Testament well. Right? And he hated the Christians. In Acts chapter 9, he was persecuting a Christian. Then Jesus is a false messiah. But he met Jesus on the road, and then he changed. And now, he wrote more than half the New Testament. Well, close to, close to half the New Testament was written by Paul. So if Jesus did not die, that means he did not rise again. If he did not rise again, why are we talking about this? Let's talk about your stakes. You see him coming from? So clearly, um, the whole Bible, as well as history, records the fact that Jesus did die and rise and rose again. Right? And if you think about it, what I just said, it presents um, a, a logical, reasonable faith, rather than say, um, Jesus went to the cross, he didn't die, suddenly there was a fire, and then, he went, then he's gone. I can make a story up like that. If you told me that, 27 years ago, I would say, you're, okay, how do you know there's a fire here? Because I read it. Oh, how do you know that's true? Right? But the resurrection recording in the New Testament is, is very reasonable. It's based on historical um, facts and causes reason, reason right? Yeah. Where's his yeah. body? The evidence of the people who wrote that, right? There's no reason for the New, New Testament writers to make this up. There's no reason. What do they gain? There is no reason. So I'm sharing the gospel with you. I don't get nothing out of it. Right? You reject it, not my fault, I don't care. I have nothing to gain. But if heaven and hell is real, as Jesus said it, then I have a lot to gain by telling you that there is salvation in Jesus. More, there's, more, there's nothing more important in this world than for me to share to you both right, that you can have heaven for free because Jesus died and rose again. There's nothing I can do better for any human being. I can give you money. If you're poor, I can help you, but and you're going to die. And when you die, you die alone. But if I tell you about Jesus, you die with him, and you will live forever in heaven. There's no other better gift for a human being than to share that with you, and then you accept Jesus. I say this to your friend, and I'll say this to you. You can go through all these historical documents and facts concerning Jesus and his resurrection. You could agree in all this stuff, but at the end of the day, and the only way you can know, and this is where the subjective comes in, that... He is also real is when you accept him as your Lord and Savior. It's like me talking to you one day. Do you know what it means to fall in love? Right? Hmm. You can talk to your girlfriend. Have you ever fallen in love? Asking you something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. if I ask you, right, do you know what it means to fall in love? Your girlfriend asks you, right? Yeah. Do you know what it means to fall in love? You can say yes. yes. You can talk to none of your friends. They can say, do you know what it means to fall in love? They say, no, no idea. <laughs> Why well, know that? You like this guy, blah, 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 and that's it. But have you ever fallen in love? No. Right? You have no idea what it means. Right? So there's also this the Christian faith is based on historical evidence. And yeah, at the end of the day, is you can come to God in your own room and say, Lord, you view to me the truth. Right? If God exists and He cares as much as the Bible says He does, then He will reveal Himself to you. It's as simple as that. You have nothing to be afraid of. Right? Worst case is well, you, you, you make a fool of yourself. Lord, are you real? <laughs> okay, no, you're not. Yes. You know, why am I praying with this? Right? You have nothing to lose. But if he's real, then he'll reveal himself to you. You have nothing to be afraid of. Right? So Jesus, again, the only man in history who rose again. Right? That is true or that is not true. 
make a choice. It makes a big difference. If it's true, it's no longer about religion. Think about it. And I went to China about this. I was talking to China, I went to China to share the gospel there and to talk about the Bible. And um, she said this to me in Cantonese. Why are you being Chinese? This is our Chinese. Why are you being Chinese? Why do you believe in a foreign God? <laughs> foreign meaning, you know, white, right? Because I'm Chinese. I said, what do you mean I believe in a foreign God? He said, yeah, the Chinese believe in a foreign God. He said, I don't believe in a foreign God. I said, you do. He goes, what? What do you mean? I said, you believe in Buddhism. You just told me earlier. She goes, yeah. I said, Buddhism comes from India. I said, you're Chinese. <laughs> okay, who believes in a friend? <laughs> Buddhism comes from India. She goes, yeah, you're Chinese. There's India, here's China. Who believes in a foreign god? <laughs> right? If you look at Chinese history, before second century, this is a fact. Before second century, China rejected Buddhism. It wasn't until second century BC after, till China accepted it. So before that, it's recorded, China worshiped a true God, the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Chinese characters, the traditional characters record the story of Genesis, the story of the Bible. It records, uh, the history records the king who made the great, the great wall. They worship the God of heaven. And the temple of heaven in Beijing was made to offer sacrifices to the God of heaven, the same way as they did in the Old Testament. Right? The Old Testament, when they sacrifice the lambs and the sheep, they cannot take away sin. But God is basically testing and calling his people to show them that you are sinful and I am holy and your sin must be punished. But he looked forward to a time when he would send his son to go to the cross to pay once and for all for those sins. So the sacrifices cannot take away sin. It's only a picture of what's to come in the future when Jesus actually became man to go to the cross to once and for all put away sin. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, if you weigh up the, the, the doctrine or the teaching of Jesus and his death and resurrection, it's very logical and it's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's not based on, it's not based on the guys talking to, um, and this is what I say this out of respect as a matter person to you as a human being. Right? If I really love you and I know the truth, I would tell you the truth. It doesn't matter if I hurt you or not, right? Right? Religion is made by man because you don't want God. If God exists, let's just say he does. He made the world. He created everything. He created man. Therefore, believing in God is not religion. It's a fact of life. You live, you're born, you die, right? And you will meet God. There's no longer a religion. If God does not exist and you make God up, then yeah, it is religion. You can believe what you want. You can believe your cup is God. Right? Nobody mm -hmm. can prove it's wrong. <laughs> right? So either God exists or he doesn't. If he exists, it's no longer about religion. Same as Jesus Christ. Jesus claimed to be God. He rose again to prove that he is God by his resurrection. Therefore, God exists. So it's logical, right? So man, where does religion come from? Think about it. You have, we're on the internet nowadays. Buddhism, Islam, Taoism, Hinduism. Which of these have a person coming back to life, right? Which of these persons claim to be God? Not Buddhism didn't claim that. Muhammad, while well, he was a prophet of God, never claimed to be God, pointed to Allah, right? Taoism, well, two Chinese philosophers never claimed to be God. Confucius definitely didn't claim to be God. So what else is there? Hinduism, a multitude of many gods. Oh my God. Yeah, but what's your evidence that they exist? Yeah, I can say this is a God. Can you prove it? No. But I can certainly believe 100% that this is God. I worship it every day. It doesn't make it God, right? So, but Jesus is the only one in history is an uh, established fact, a real person in history. His body's not there. And we can argue for his resurrection, right? Not only historically, but also that uh, people's lives have changed. When I met the Lord 27 years ago, it was in my bedroom, and I changed overnight. Not because I felt sorry for my sins. It wasn't because, oh, I felt sorry for doing all the bad things. I think my desire to change, become a monk or a priest or whatever the heck you want to call it, right? It wasn't like that. I didn't care about people. But I went into my room and God spoke to my heart, realizing the way I'm going, I'm going to end up in hell. That was the main issue. I'm going to go to hell. And that was focusing my mind. And in that night, in that darkest time in my night there, I realized Jesus died on the cross for sinners. Jesus died for me. 
So my sins has been dealt with. Now bow on my knees and thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins so I don't have to go to hell. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior and I was changed in one night. You found the truth? Yeah. But that truth is not just for me, right? The Bible says that we're all sinners. So it's not just me. It's all oh, good for you, Chi. More power to you, but it's not for me, right? Jesus died on the cross for sinners, and the whole world are sinners. If Jesus died on the cross for sinners, that means we're all sinners. So that means you need him too. You see where I'm coming from? It's not just for, well, you're a bad person. I'm a good person. I don't need it. The Bible says all have sinned, right? And we just read earlier, God has appointed a day in which he will judge this world in righteousness. Right? Everybody will be judged. That's what it comes down to. So that's why it's a very serious matter for Easter. Right? Is If Jesus rose again, then he is the truth. If he didn't rise again, then we're wasting our time talking about this. There's, there's no middle ground. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's a good... Um, I'm glad you brought that up though, AJ. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for saying that. You say it, you explain it really nice. I like it. Like really word by word. Like, thank you. I think that was really the thing that helped me from myself in between, even though I, I, I believe in faith back in when I was a teen. And then as I started being skeptical, I started studying the historical facts and everything. I think one of the things I could not deny was that there were witnesses for sure historically that he did die. Like it was proven, and even the soldiers were like poking him, and then it was prophet. I think what what what, what threw me was like thousands of years ago, the prophesied that this person's gonna die. This Jesus said it wasn't even invented yet, and then actually they said that this person, the Messiah, was like his legs not gonna be broken. All these things that they actually specifically were told that this person was supposed to die, like it actually happened to Christ, and it was like that's actually impossible. Like one chance out of I don't know how many millions of you saying that there's a coincidence, there's none, and then even when they pierced his side. There was like water and stuff flowing out shows that he was actually dead, right? Um, I think what was interesting was that, like you said, I, I think it was really interesting how you talk about the woman was a West witness, and which is kind of bad, just like us, <laughs> like we were worth nothing for witness, which is true. But I think interesting was like Jesus was rec it was recorded that Jesus not only appeared to disciples but other people, like over five hundred right. other people, and he actually ate with them to show that it wasn't just a spirit; it was a human person. So that actually totally, what well, I can say, sealed the deal for me. Because I'm like, I don't know if you know me, but like, I'm totally like a most skeptical person. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, like, like FBI, CIA, all forensic files, I like all that stuff like that. I'm all about evidence and everything. Because I don't want to waste my time placing my faith and like giving my life over to something that is like, like, forget it's it. Like, I changed my faith. life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm placing my life on this thing. You know, like, I, like it's like, it's like a, I make a commitment, I make a decision to love my husband, marry this dude. Right? Even though we have problems and stuff, so it's okay, it's a perfect relationship. But relationship with God's different. He's perfect, but I'm not. Like she was saying, I think it was really good that you said that. There's no difference. It doesn't make us any better people. The only difference is, yeah, we're just better off. That's actually a very good point. It's just that I know where I'm going after. It's only a different thing. And I think that's why I try to tell my friends too, right? I said, you know me. You know, I'm the best person that if I have the best restaurant in town, the best shopping, best discount, best food, best whatever... You know, I, I feel like I have the right to tell you. If not, you're going to go, hell, why are you talking about the deal? Why are you talking about this? What's going on? And, and I think one of the challenges for me was when I was in hospital when I was 15 and I was paralyzed and um, the doctors gave me 24 hours to live. And then actually, miraculously, I was um, made alive. I made a pact with God. I didn't know God did. I said, God, if you were real, then uh, heal me. Make me walk. But I did. I was able to walk, but I couldn't run. So stupid. I should have said, make me run. <laughs> But it's almost like my left leg was meant to be, like, left behind to say, hey, you, you broke your promise. Because at that time, I didn't know anything. I said, like, if you're real, you know, I'll, I'll be, like, a, a nun, you know, whatever. Got late. Um, so it wasn't until two years later on that I realized, like, like you know, long story short, I was about to kill myself over stupid things in, you know, teenager. And I actually fell on my knees and actually said, Lord, like, just cheat. Like, I, I challenge, I challenge God. I said, uh, is, it, is it true? Is it true what they say about you? Because I did go to one of the calls that they you shared about the gospel, like Christ is real and you died. And I said, if you're really real, then, then I don't want to go to hell. If, if I kill myself, then it's actually going to the worst place. But if you're real, real, then show me. 
they show me. Like, I actually challenge God. They show me. Like, you just take away. Because right now, I've been so miserable, I just want to kill myself. Like, literally, I have nothing to live for. But you show me. And then I will believe. And I, I, I confess, I pray, and I ask. It's like, I just start crying, crying. And there's this gospel track my brother had given me way back then. And I just pray. I said, Lord, okay, I have sinned. I, I obviously have no life, no no purpose. And I at that moment, not everyone has experienced the same thing. Just as like you just sharing my experience. Only that. Well, everyone's different, right? Um... I just literally felt the weight off my chest, like my back, everything's gone. And I was so scared, seriously, I did not even tell my brothers. For two weeks, I kept reading and praying the thing, and I just felt like, I don't know. It was just very different. Um, and it wasn't just about the eternal life of salvation I'm thinking about, because I realized something about me had changed that I did not expect. Um, one of the things for me was the swearing part. Like, you know, he's a gangster guy, but, you know, we live in Chinatown, and to survive, basically, you know, you kind of act cool, and we live in Chinatown half my life, you know, here, and uh, I swear, like, every single sentence, it wouldn't be, like, the person that you see me, and it's not like I asked to change, I say, oh, you know, God, you make me to be a better person, I never asked for any of this, and I thought that was, that's the thing, the thing that's, that, that freaked me out, changed me the most, like, was, like, how come I don't swear anymore? I notice my friends are asking me how can we change, and I, uh, I, I, I understand that part, and I think that was like the, um, I call I call it the second byproduct of extra bonus, of, of 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 accepting Christ in our life because He paid our debt for our sin, and He became our, and He substituted, He gave us His righteousness. Somehow He He changed us automatically to something like you know some people are thinking oh, pray for Him and you get changed. Well, I think that's a second byproduct. I think the main part is he came to die for our sins, number one, I think. But I think the second part was the bonus part was like, we become different people, which I didn't expect that. That was kind of like a, you know, after a thing. And then more and more, I guess, following him, um, I automatically just do that. Things that I wouldn't normally do. I'm not saying I'm perfect, which I'm totally not. Like, I'm just a regular, just like anybody else. But I know that I'm forgiven. And that's actually kind of interesting. Cool. So anyway, going back to it, um, for me, I still studied, and I still study a lot, and even till this day, because of all the different world religions and everything, I did not want to be the stupid person <laughs> that actually like fell for something, but it wasn't just my emotional thinking. Like, was this an emotionalism that I thought about? Did I, did I, did I uh, that's why I didn't tell my brothers. Did I, did I make it up? Did I, did I change because of the way I thought? And I go, it wasn't just a feeling. And then the more, for the last few, like 10, 15, 20 years, I've been, studying a lot and making sure there was historical evidence, there was um, factual things, and even whether it's theological um, gifted people, not really listening to people. You listen to teachers too, for a say, because I'm not an engineer. Like William right there, I always want to sleep my little brother. He's tired, but he's an engineer. But sometimes, you know, engineers are great, but there's different people. Like there's some trust and faith involved. I don't know everything. You know, like the light, I don't know how light works. I just know if I push that button, it's going to turn on, right? I don't have no idea. <laughs> but then, you know, it's like if I don't cook, you know how you have to marinate 10 hours to make that juicy meat? That's your experience. You know, but I may not know. I just can go by faith that AJ's not going to poison me, you know? I'm going to eat it because you're my good neighbor and you love me. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of like some faith. So I think I, I used to let you know, like... um it wasn't until I placed my faith and trust in Jesus and say I'm sorry and I believe that you did die for me, then the rest came. The rest, everything came. I don't pretend that I know anything from the Bible at all before when I, when I first, after, when I was 17, right? Mm -hmm. When I came to say that. And I, when I finally confessed and told my two brothers, he got me my first Bible. And I didn't believe it, like, because for me, I hate studying, I hate reading. Something changed in me. I love reading, I couldn't stop reading this thing. Not that I understand anything? No, I didn't. It's just like reading something. It's just like a new person, right? I just changed completely. And I don't know what happened. I can't even explain it. But for me, to be honest, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And I think that's kind of exciting because Easter is the greatest celebration. And because of Christ's resurrection, his death, and his, he is alive. He's real. It's not a fiction of imagination. It's not like he's dead and he's gone. It's, he's actually alive and he lives in our life, in our heart. And it does change us. Changes to love, changes to forgive, changes to have like all these good things. These are byproducts of being saved by God, and I think that's kind of cool. And I'm so 
so thankful that you guys came today because I didn't expect you to come, right? I just, for me, to be honest, Easter is like, oh, just last minute. I was like, I'm going to buy everybody. I literally, you should see, you should see my list. I would buy, I would, I don't know, 100 people maybe? Oh, wow. Like, because I was last minute because yeah. it was Tuesday I sent it out. I decided on Monday, I was like, Chief, hey, do you want to speak for us? I just felt like, I feel like a lot of my friends, I don't know, for some reason, I felt like this year I don't want to go to a church service. I could go to church service. But I just feel like doing it at home, celebrating with my friends, and some of my friends still don't know, and they won't come to the church with me. Because mm -hmm. church is scary. Sometimes people don't like they want to go into a church. They want to hear a story, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, we do, do us the honor of sharing what Easter is all about and what it means, and uh, he, he, was, he was gracious about that. And so I go, whoever would come will come, because this is the Easter long weekend. A lot of people go away and stuff like that. So I'm really, really thankful you guys came. Yeah, we're happy to be here. invited all the, I remember everybody, seriously, everybody. Everybody got stuff, but this last minute, I didn't, the invitation didn't come till Tuesday, so. So, yeah, I'm just very thankful you guys came. Yeah, we're happy to be here. Yeah.